This is Greg Gallus on Green Gregs and Galactic Gregs. I'm doing a joint program today for both of my YouTube channels for Galactic Gregs because I've been doing power grid defense videos on Galactic Gregs since I started my channel. Pretty close to since I started it because I have actually chaired two power grid defense uh, conferences. And power grid defense is a key topic if you're interested in saving the power in a you know, grid, if you're interested in prepping. But it's also an important topic for space. So much so that my local chapter of the National Space Society, the Huntsville, Alabama L5 Society, which I founded in 1983, by the way, uh, sponsored two power grid defense conferences, and that's how we ran them. Uh, but why would space be interested in, in power grid defense? Simply because if you don't have a power grid, you don't have a future. If our power grid goes down, the risk of what can happen is so severe that we just may not come back. We've got to get our grid secured. And for that reason, I'm bringing on uh, David Womick. David is here producing a video, The Dark Sky Event. And his video is a documentary. And he's going to set up a website that's going to have uh, more in-depth stuff on it, uh, uh, with more in-depth interviews, and things that you can do to take action yourself uh, to help get this grid secured. We're not here just talking about it. The one thing I do do on my channels is talk about, especially on Green Gregs, is thing you need to be aware of uh, in case things happen. But I also try to be more proactive to say, let's keep it from happening. The best prepping thing that you can do is prevent the problem in the first place. And so that's our objective here. But if we fail to prevent it, you're going to have to be prepared. <laughs> so I cover that for, I'm covering this for both channels today. And what we'll do here is we'll go quickly in. David, tell us a little bit about yourself. Just say, tell us who you are and we'll, we'll do the, uh, uh, we'll show the trailer here in a minute. So David, okay. tell us a little bit well, about yourself. Tell us why well, you're doing this program, why you're doing this documentary. Well, I'll tell you, I, I got interested in grid security and everything and, and preparing back uh, after I read um, the One Second After and realized that, uh, you know, uh, securing the grid was, was something we needed to do in this country and what the consequences would be if we didn't. And then so in 2017, after they closed down the uh, first EMP commission, I was... Um, uh, moved by Dr. Peter Pry and Hank Cooper, who came on and kind of made a call for people uh, to come out and, and, and support them in grassroots movements to uh, get Congress and the government's attention and the power industry's attention about the problem that we face with the grid. And so I thought, hey, what can I do? I've been a film producer for 30 years and have made a couple of different documentaries. And um, so I decided to make a documentary about the power grid and uh, the threats we face and what we can do to uh, move forward in a resilient way. Okay, very good. What I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna share this and we're going to actually have a look at this trailer, guys. Ladies and gentlemen, here is the trailer to the Dark Sky event. The Black Sky event. Black Sky event. <laughs> That's Pardon okay. Me. Yeah, I'm bad about that. That's all right. You can me. we assume tomorrow is going to be like yesterday was, and that our civilization will go on forever. We should learn from history that civilization doesn't go on forever. Sometimes it ends and ends catastrophically. Uh, we have built Western civilization on the electron and on electricity without the strategic design of resilience built in. It's just given that our electric grid that would be safe. That is no longer. Our adversaries are planning to use the electromagnetic spectrum as a war fighting domain. Every hostile power on the planet understands America's vulnerabilities. The world is in much more dangerous shape now than it was during the Cold War. Even if none of the enemies act on those plans, there will be a coronal mass ejection capable of destroying the electric grid as we know. Thank you. 
Move far too long. We talked about developing strategy, developing strategy, developing plan. We don't understand EMP events extraordinarily well. We've done EMP tests on hundreds of military systems. Very little is getting done in terms of real protection. There are technological solutions that can mitigate the threats to the grid. I never want to be sitting here in the dark saying I told you so. The life skills that we need to survive without electricity, they're gone. The entire country is a disaster. You are on your own. The cavalry is not coming. 10, 20, 30 percent of the population is wise, ready, and smart. They can save the rest. We know how to protect against it. I just worry if we have enough time. We're running out of time. Excellent, excellent, David. Thank you. <laughs> so that's the trailer one. This is will be. How long will the documentary be that you're going to release initially? It's it's a feature length documentary, so you know, ninety to one one hundred twenty minutes. Right now, we're in post production, and we did thirty five interviews from leading experts across the country. So and that includes uh, me, by the way, right? <laughs> that includes you, and I got a story to tell about you. You were awesome. So our first uh, our first forte into interviewing people we came over to the grid security conference you had in Huntsville and I I think I, you were the first person I talked to Greg because I was like hey Greg can we come over and you're like sure come on over you know and you guys were really nice and uh, we came over and met Dr. Pry and some of the other people there and Tommy Waller from the secure the grid coalition and and Michael maybe, and, and some of the great folks that are involved in this cause. And that was really our, our step off point for the documentary. And so I really appreciate you and, uh, and your folks over there, you've done a great job. All right. Well, thank you. A lot of people, even though I talk about this on my channel, they don't realize how involved I am. I'm a participant in Tommy Waller's secure the grid teleconference. Yeah. As, Weekly you know, call. Every week. I'm a yeah. member of InfoGuard and I have had Dr. Peter Vincent Pry. I've had uh, uh, Mike Maybe, who you've shown in your uh, trailer there, and uh, on this channel, along with uh, Ambassador uh, Hank Cooper, I've uh, mm -hmm. had uh, General uh, Ken Krosniak, you know, a lot of the, the good heavy hitters from our community have been on my channel, and I'm going to bring them back, and probably Tommy Waller and a few others, and I've also had uh, another individual producing a documentary who's, you know, the same way right. you. So uh, we've, uh, you know, I'm out here trying to get the word out to people of how vital this is. And a lot of people really just, you know, they think, okay, the lights go out and, you know, okay, we'll fix it all. And we'll be back up in a few months and no big deal. What well, they don't realize, David, is that when the lights go out, uh, the biggest, most vulnerable component is those ginormous uh, uh, high voltage transformers. The high Absolutely. Power. Yeah, the ones that, that, that can send, uh, you know, you know, uh, you know, up to 700,000 volts out, you know, there, there are various levels for different distances, you know, some are 350,000, 450,000, there's various different gradations on these transformers, but these things are as big as a house, they weigh 200 tons. Uh, there's only like uh, uh, 11 of the slap mold type cars that move them around in the country, there's just a few, just a handful. Uh, Absolutely, and they're made all over the world, they're made in South Korea and Germany, and, and uh, really, one of the interesting things we found out recently, well, about a year ago, was that um, China manufactures some of these too. And I, I didn't realize they manufacture some of the large transformers, but they actually do. They've got a, a lot of other components in the grid. But uh, about a year ago, uh, they pulled one of these large transformers out um, and took it to a military base and actually did find some back doors built into it. So that transformer made it, never made it to the grid. And that's why you see a lot of stuff uh, about China now and backdoors and Huawei and, and the other companies and concerns about technology because that's what they do. They steal stuff, cyber and, and put in backdoors to our grid. And, that, and That's why. That is why President Trump ruled that we cannot have Chinese-made components in our power. These major absolutely. Components. Because they found 
that that backdoor electronic device that would report back to China, and they had a, it was basically like a cell phone built in. Yep. And it would just report back, and it probably also gave them the ability to shut the thing down. Yeah, uh, absolutely. It was, it was, it was that a, transformer. It, it was the internal means for them to, to shut a grid down. In fact, that they would even send us something like that tells you what their intent is. People, oh, China's not going to do this. Not gonna, the heck, they've already are putting components out. They've already been hacking our grid. Yeah. Uh, you know, trial run type hacks. Uh, they have the EMP super weapon technology. What a lot of people don't understand, the EMP super weapon, uh, this was declassified in 2008 because Dr. General, Dr. William Graham, who was uh, uh, the foremost expert in the United States on the EMP. And head State. of the EMP commission, yeah. Yeah, he's head of the EMP commission. And Spencer, even as the administrator of NASA, uh, Dr. William Graham testified to Congress what the Soviet generals told him. And he said in his congressional record, well, we thought it was classified to found this, that the MP super weapons could be about 200,000 volts per meter on the lines and wires. That is uh, five times, well, excuse me, four times higher than the 50,000 volts per meter uh, mill spec for hardening, which we thought was good enough based on the star, uh, star fish prime. Uh, I'm a space guy. It's hard for me to say star right. fish. But <laughs> <first show. laughs> yeah, and I mean, they, they the really, star, yeah, they, prime experiment. Yeah. That we, that we, what we found from that was set a lot of our standards, and those are, are just not adequate for the weapons that are designed to maximize the gamma rays they put out. For those that don't understand, an EMP comes uh, from the gamma rays put out by a nuclear weapon. And the smaller ones are better because they don't have all the shielding on those. Correct. Less general radiation. And so they, they put out a maximum pulse of, of uh, gamma rays. The gamma rays strip electrons from the atoms in the atmosphere and produce an actual electrical wave traveling through the atmosphere, multi-frequency spans they can fry smaller devices and larger devices too. So you get the E1, E2, and E3 components uh, of your EMP uh, from a nuclear EMP event. And yeah, of, of all the threats that, that we feature in the film, um, uh, you know, CME from the sun, a cyber attack, a physical attack, an EMP is the one that we probably have no great answers for and we would never come back from and and the power industry doesn't want to deal with any of them but they really don't want to deal with emp because i i just feel like uh they have no good answer for it really i mean it would just fry so many of the components not only the the chips and everything and all their control systems that aren't hardened which are very few a few power companies now have gone in and hardened some of their control areas uh control rooms and stuff but you know, you have all these SCADA boxes in everything all over the grid and they don't have thousands of backups sitting there for them. Just like they don't have backups for those large transformers that are pretty much irreplaceable. It takes a year and a half just to yeah. get one of them. So well, it takes a year and a half to get it on the loading dock after you order it. <laughs> And, and that's if you have gas and communications <laughs> and if you can, if you even have somebody to go move it, like there's going to be anybody there after a month to go in and move well, that, you know, that's actually off, still working for the still power have plant. You have a bank account to pay for it. You have to have yeah. the internet to order it over. <laughs> you have some way to task the people that's going to move it. Uh, yeah. A year and a half when it comes here, there, you know, how many gas stations are going to be operating with no grid? Uh, how many trucks are going to be able to roll? Uh, will you be able to get spare parts? And they're, they're nothing will be working. Uh, no. and, and, and they estimate that nine out of 10 of our population will be dead in a year. So you're talking six months after nine out of 10 people, including yeah. your qualified technicians that would be available to install stuff like this. It takes a huge network of people to do these kind of things. And I think it's like Humpty Dumpty. Once Humpty Dumpty yeah. falls, you know, all the king's horses and all the king's men just aren't going to be able to put them together again. No, well, it, Funny. And we oh. interviewed for the documentary, we interviewed Jim Robb, the president and CEO of NERC. And NERC makes all the standards, you know, uh, for the grid, how the grid runs and everything. And um, that was an interesting interview. It was enlightening to see how little some people that are really high up know and understand the threats. And that's one of the reasons we're doing this, because there's a lot of people in government and otherwise in the military and everything you know, they really don't understand the threats that we face and they can, 
they put them off in this corner as low probability. But if you take all the threats together, the probability goes up. I mean, I mean, just from a CME, a coronal mass ejection from the sun, you know, there's a 50% chance in my children and grandchildren's lifetime that that'll happen. I think it's like 12% every 10 years is I believe yes, what NASA yeah. said. Well, and, and bear in mind, uh, bear in mind, but let me, let me bring you up yeah. to on that. Okay. That's the probability you get a Carrington scale event. Yeah, a Carrington scale event. Yeah, we now, have other ones. Oh, no, no, hang on with it. It's worse than that because the Earth's magnetic sphere is right. dropping and field strength rapidly. Our shields are dropping, which means a smaller CMB could have a bigger effect. Have a bigger effect. It might wow. be, you know, the railroad event in 1921 will probably take our grid down today. And it might not be long until something like that took down the, the Quebec of the grid back in 1989 could do the same thing. And we had a near miss in 2012, by the 2012, way. 2012, yeah. Very, very close near miss of a Carrington scale event. Yeah. Now, some people, oh, that was it. No, the probability is the probability that we hit Earth. The sun shoots these out in different directions over time. Right. That's a probability that one's actually going to hit Earth. So, yeah. These Absolutely. And we, we interviewed, we went out to the Space Weather Center where they, where they monitor the sun 24-7. And we interviewed the, the assistant director there. And it's amazing. I mean, and, and, you know, people don't really think that's real. And that's the problem with a lot of this. They see it in movies and stuff and they kind of see it science fiction or they kind of think it's science fiction. And because that's the way it's almost presented in a lot of movies. But, um, you know, it, it's a real problem and people need to understand that it's real. And, and this is one of the problems, you know, again, if we not only mother nature from the sun, but if our enemies, our enemies know about this vulnerability, it's our Achilles heel. And, and the first time we go into a shooting war with anybody, Russia, China, or already in our grid, they're going to take our grid down because they're going to want to pull us back from the, from the Pacific or from Europe or wherever suits them. That and is, Iran and North Korea, their proxies are also coming up in the world and, and getting more capabilities. All right. It's a fact that we know that's in the military written doctrine. Yep. Iran of North Korea, China, and Russia to do just that. That is in Absolutely. the doctrine. It's, yep. it's, it's what they it has teach been. their people. And that's what they say they're going to do. They've even said, you know, that's what they would do. So, so the, the, there's, you know, this idea that some kind of surprise is mind boggling. <laughs> well, uh, the idea that we're not prepared for it is mind boggling. Uh, I mean, that is the thing. But like you said, the problem is a lot of people, even the high ups don't really appreciate the gravity of it. And they don't understand. And there's somebody, yeah. well, they got it covered over here. Or these guys got this over that's there. That's right. DOE's they, got it. DHS has got it. The military's got the it. And stops, none of them have the got it. stops over there. But right. Nobody's got it. That's what and, we found out and determined. And nobody yeah. can show you. I've heard people say, oh, well, the, the uh, National Guards all have the plans. They got the doctor. And it's they have no plan. Yeah, blah, 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 blah. Well, go ask the adjutant general or, yeah. or uh, of the state who's in charge of the National Guard. Go Zero. ask the... Uh, EMA director of the state. I have talked to both in Alabama. They go, what? No, we don't have it. But I've had even there is no Dr. Plan. Major say, oh yeah, we got it. This blah, blah, blah. No, you don't. You don't have it. Mm -hmm. so go ask the guys who are in charge of all this in any state and they'll all tell you the same thing. Nope, we don't have it. The state that's closest right now to getting the job done is, well, the states are North and South Carolina. Thanks to our friend, uh, Hank Cooper. Hank and Cooper. Cooper yep. has been at the forefront. I've got him on my channel. And believe it or not, that, that video has not been one of the least performing videos. I don't know how people think, oh, an ambassador, he's not real. <laughs> no, he's, he's a brilliant a, man. <laughs> he's a brilliant Smart man. Smart guy. Super nice. We interviewed him and, and talked about his project over on Lake Norman with Duke Power. And, oh, yeah. And it's an amazing project. And another amazing project is going on in Austin. Um, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, San Antonio, Texas, where they are actually securing the grid in San Antonio. It's a partnership between the city, the military, and the power company, which is one of the huge problems is you can never get those three people to agree on anything. But here it's an unusual case because the city actually owns the power company and there's 10 military bases there. So everybody's interests are tied close enough uh, so that they've decided to harden the grid in San Antonio. And we went out and, and covered that in, in one of their meetings. So we talk about that in the documentary, but that's real interesting. And that's, they actually just got some funding from DHS and some other people 
Um, that's one of the things that came out from the EMP executive order that President Trump uh, issued was that they would get some funding for that. And they actually won some of that funding. So we're, we're excited about that because hopefully that'll provide a blueprint for other cities that want to do it. And um, that is something that we can help with here. Yeah. People on this channel can get involved in. Absolutely. Writing letters and, and doing the things that I talk about that a lot. To do yes. That. And by the way, the, the two of the individuals who were key at spearheading that was uh, General Stephen Quast Yes. Major Stuckenmeyer. And you showed them both in your trailer. I saw them. They were both fantastic interviews. And I'll tell you a funny story. So as a matter of fact, it was right after um, they, they, General Quast formed the Electronic Defense Task Force. And I met some people at the um, um, grid meeting in Huntsville the first time. It was two years ago, August. And in September, they had a, a meeting at a secret level with EDTF where they brought in 200 experts from all over the world, military experts, power experts, grid experts. Uh, and it was about, uh, uh, you know, the problems with the EMS spectrum, electromagnetic spectrum in particular, not just EMP, <clears throat> excuse me, not just EMP and stuff. But uh, so we went to that conference and uh, we weren't really approved to be at that conference, but we were kind of on the out lying. They had a little press junket and we actually got approved to go into that, but we had, so I didn't get to interview uh, General Quast or uh, Major Stuckenberg at that one. But then when they had the next EDTF, they had made it so that there was a, a track for 200 uh, people who didn't have clearance and 200 who did have clearance. And so I actually got to go through the track and it was fascinating and fascinating to see the scenarios that, you know, the military thought might happen and, and uh, to sit around and hear the opinions of power company executives and uh, other people who are experts in the grid talk about the problems openly. And um, it was an eye opener. And General Quast, I actually did get to hunt him and David down there. And I finally got approval from the Air Force Public Affairs uh, people to, they weren't following me around at this one. Last one, they were kind of, I think they had a tail on me. <laughs> <laughs> this one, I finally got approval or they got approval from them to interview. So we got, a, a, you know, a, in a uniform interview from him. And it was, it was amazing because, you know, he is, he's not with the Air Force anymore. And uh he retired and uh so which well, is a whole nother bad. story he should have been the head of the space command he should have been head of the space force he's a brilliant man a brilliant communicator and i feel like they missed a great opportunity there yes absolutely all right you know what i'm going to do i'm going to show uh i'm going to share in a minute some why uh people should really be so concerned about this uh, beyond okay. transformers now actually these transformers we talked about can be secured. They're the hardest things. To, to, yep. uh, we have the technology through putting surge blockers in the center tap, basically. Uh, well, they have one out and they have a, a functioning one out in Idaho. Yeah. We, we can harden those. The skaters, yeah. you can put a lot of those in Faraday cages and you, know, you can use mill, mill standards for some of the boxes, but right. uh, the best thing is those are easier to replace on those transformers. Yeah. There's lots of them, but yeah. we, it, but it, we can at least get certain critical parts of the grid running. And we, most importantly, we've got to keep the uh, uh, water flow into the cooling poles of the nuclear power plants. So I'm about to show everybody why, but before I do that, Absolutely. I tell everyone, hey, I do a lot of the videos, especially on green grids about power grid defense uh, and other things that you need to be aware of. So that you, the proposition of the green grid channel is to help you survive, thrive, and stay out of the hive. Now, the Galactic Grid channel is, is more about, you know, technology in the future, but you're not going to get there if the grid goes down. So this is a, 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 something that has a cross entrance, interest, I should say. I don't think it's share button. I started to open something. So before I do that, let me go here. I'm going to uh, show people what we need to consider, though. Uh, in case it goes down, you need to know that you've got to be ready uh, because right now, we're not getting this done and we're we're in a critical crux right now worldwide there are things that could bring our grid down in just a few months and we're not gonna be able to have it ready so in the meantime you need to get your stuff ready just in case so what i'm going to tell you is that you need to, to 
be prepared. Prepping is important for everyone. And in order to be aware of that, I think this thing maximize for just a second. <laughs> I have a special deal through prepwithgreg.com where you can get uh, a four week food supply with, for one person, 2,000 calories per day for $100 off. You can save a third on the cost. This is 25 year storage food for only $197 for a month's supply of food for one person. That is a deal. That's 2,000 calories per day, 280, uh, 284 servings. Uh, it's got breakfast, lunch, dinner. Uh, and you can see it comes in these nice handy to uh, carry buckets. So it's, it's just hard to beat this. Uh, for long-term food storage, this is an awesome deal. It even has desserts and drinks, as you can see down here. So uh, this is something that can definitely keep you in a good mood while you're uh, living in your bunker or can't get out and about or whatever the case is that you've got to prep for. But it's just something you need to have in mind. And you better get them while they're getting good because we're going to have food prices going up real soon. So I don't know how long this deal is going to last. Uh, as the, the sources of the food are going up, I see soybeans are going up right now. And a lot of other things, uh, we've had the, the drench killing my crops out uh, in uh, Iowa. And we've got uh, China is going to be buying everything they can because their crops have been devastated by floods and locusts. And good gracious, they're having all kinds of environmental problems over there. So you need to get ready for that. Uh, and I'm going to show you a, a PowerPoint presentation. We'll do another share here real quick. Um, let me find the right thing here. Give me a second. There we are. All right. Now, what we're looking at here is the magnitude of the threat. And what I'm, this data is about four years old. At the time that I made this chart, we had over 74,000 metric tons of spent fuel rods sitting in the cooling pools at the nuclear power plants. Now, if you figured the, the, the warheads of Russia and America and, and what else around the world, and you assume there's 40 pounds of, of nuclear material for each warhead, then you would come out with saying that the, the radioactive equivalent of this is something like 280 full-scale nuclear wars. Uh, uh, just radioactive material, setting these spent fuel rod pools, waiting on the lights to go out to go up in smoke. Oh, no, Greg, they're not going to go up in smoke. Oh, wait, let me, just, let me show you. Can it possibly happen? You know, uh, we got a lot of stuff in there. I am going to skip ahead a little bit to some other charts. Um, so while I'm skipping ahead, I might hit on a couple of things. Uh, here are those uh, transformers. Uh, I will get down to another chart, and I'll blow this up full screen a little bit. Uh, these are those large, large transformers I was talking about. Uh, they're, they're huge. Uh, their coils are hand wound. Uh, you know, they're, they're hard to move. You can see them on a, a utility boat here. Here's one of those rail cars, special built rail cars for them. Uh, that's a smaller one, by the way. Uh, this is the kind you move on a truck. Look what kind of truck platform you're going to have if you're going to move it by truck. <laughs> uh, maybe I should blow this up, but I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm really aiming to get down to another part of my presentation right here. Uh, yeah, yeah. Now I'm going to blow it up. We'll go full scale here. Bam. So we have in the United States a lot of nuclear power plants. Now, this is Brown's Ferry. This one's about 26 miles from me. And this is a fresh brown. That, this is when they were building their uh, uh, boiling water reactor here. Uh, and we had a storm back in 2011. It nearly knocked us out. This is one of the cooling poles. The cooling poles. Uh, are 20 foot deep in water, but the water evaporates at 160 gallons a minute. Uh, the roof over these, these are not in containment buildings. The roof is a sheet metal roof. Uh, so they have the fuel pellets and they're assembled into rods and they're coated in zircaloid. With this. Now this is the area right here. See, this is where the reactor would be, this ginormous containment building. So if something goes wrong, like everything's contained. But the rods are stored, the spent fuel rods, and just a regular building with a sheet metal roof over it. So you don't have the same level of protection when these catch on fire. Uh, you know, this is showing you what the roof looked like in some of these buildings in Fukushima when things got bad. Of course, you know, you know they blew up, essentially, some of those did. Uh, this shows you where uh, uh, these plants are located. And this is another depiction of these plants with some of the keep out zones. 
and this shows you that the, the rate at which we're producing the spent fuel, this is no chart in the end in 2015, and we're wondering where the heck were we going to put it all when they were making this chart. Well, that's five years ago. <laughs> Here's what's vulnerable. It's these generators. These generators uh, can also be taken down. This is what is backed up to provide the cooling water should the grid go down. Now, a lot of people don't understand that a nuclear power plant doesn't produce the fuel, uh, the power it needs to run itself. Uh, you can't, the load balancing just won't work. There's several other reasons that that don't happen and they didn't really think they were gonna happen. In fact, you have to have something like a coal-fired plant or something else to start a nuclear power plant. Uh, yeah, we don't get into all that. So uh, the operative thing here is that, uh, I had charts on this, I guess it's in another presentation, but I do have charts that show what happens when, let me stop this here. Oh, let's see here, I got it. All right, David, there we are. Now we're back in gallery view, that's where I want to be. <laughs> <laughs> Pardon me, viewers. I lost you for a second, that's okay. Yeah, yeah, I went switching over to the Google, I'm not Google, the uh, Zoom got hung up. Yeah. So usually when I stop a share, it comes snap right back into uh, whichever view format I got it set up for. And I got it set up where it should just be showing the individual like myself right now is running his mouth. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So uh, I have set it up where you see both people saying at the same time all the time that gets kind of boring. And sometimes we like to take a sip of coffee when we're not running our mouth. <laughs> That's all right. Definitely. So, these fuel rods will burn on contact with air. Uh, I've got another presentation. I have to dig it up. I thought it was in that presentation where I've got pictures where the Sandia National Laboratories did the experiments where they um, actually, uh, they caught on fire and it caught on fire a lot easier than I thought they would. Right. They are enriched, uh, these fuel rods, when they're reactor, they're enriched in hydrogen and, and other things. So when they get uh, contact with oxygen, uh, or the, these fuel rods are hot, they absolutely will burn. Right. The question, they've already tested. I've had people, even they work in nuclear power plants, told me, oh, this won't happen. Ah, oh, that won't happen, it won't happen. I got some of this stuff sitting on my bookshelf. Yeah, but it's not what's been in the reactor. And yeah, right. this is akin to the zirconium that a lot of ladies are wearing on their fingers, but this is zirconoly, alloy of the zirconium. Uh, the reason they use that is that the uh, steel and a lot of your other metals won't hold up to all the radiation. So they had to find something that could hold these rods together, but they will not, uh, you've got to keep them covered in water. Uh, and when they built the grid, they didn't imagine the whole grid going down when they built these plants. They didn't, well, no. it wasn't in their mind. So <laughs> this is the issue, David. It, it's how do we deal with that and how do you deal with keeping that water flowing to them when air, all your infrastructure is shattered and right what we got to have the edge of the generals and the national guard working on and they've told me they don't have the plan for that even they, though I, they have no plan just like they have no plan for the whole country in a national disaster i mean the NIAC report that came out i believe about a year ago or a year and a half ago even Well, I lost you there. I don't know what happened there. So maybe David will be back with us in a minute. He's mostly having a internet problem. He's froze. So I uh, hope we'll get him back. Uh, that happens sometimes. We have glitches. Um, but he's, what, what's, what's happened is we have a grid in this country that's not secure. The companies don't want to secure it. Some of us are, are fighting to get it secure. And we're meeting resistance at every step of the way. But a lot of the people resisting us don't fully understand uh, the problems and issues. And quite often, the industry teams up at EFRI and some of these organizations that are out there hire business majors and politicians to, I think, oh, hey, we lost him completely. So maybe he'll join back in in a minute. Uh, we've lost David, he's not a participant now. He's, he must have had internet down. <laughs> so, what we have to know is they are not doing what they need to do from their end to make sure that we're safe. They have not taken care of us. They, um, I'm just hoping I'm watching, see if you'll come in for a minute. Um, we have to push for it. There are two organizations, the National Electric Reliability Corporation, which is an industry group, and the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. Here he comes. 
Hello. There you are. I was, <laughs> I was starting to explain Nurk and Ferk. I lost you. So I should oh, continue. That's okay. to, I should probably at least continue on Nurk and Ferk. So, yeah, go ahead. So the, 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 they're set up such that the, maybe it's crazy, but the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission is set up such that they don't propose the, the regulations. They are set up to take the proposals from the industry group, NERC. <laughs> Self-regulating. Regulatory Commission. So it's like the fox runs the hen house. He don't watch it. He runs it. It is a very bad, incestuous relationship between the regulator and the regulatee. In fact, it runs backwards. It's the other way around. And then you get organizations such as EFRI that's out there uh, running defense for them uh, that, 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 that does everything they can to stymie what our engineers and scientists are putting out there. We have engineers and scientists, physicists who understand this, people who run tests, tested components, and seen what this stuff de- does from the EMP commission and so forth. But then you get somebody who's a history major or a politician or something else, and they get over, uh, they put together a report because all oh, this is not a problem. Well, they're full of bogus whatever. You know? <laughs> <laughs> right. I mean, they, they just, uh, I mean, it's self-regulatory and, and, you know, uh, NERC is made up 85% of the voting members are from the electric industry. So, you know, it's, it's a very self-serving organization and they, when they make regulations, they have a track record of making regulations that are uh, the lowest standard that they can put out. And they say that people will, uh, that the companies go up and above and beyond that. But the interesting thing about that is we interviewed a company, a gentleman from a company who, uh, they power companies hire to test is a red team and they go in and test and break into substations. This is more getting back into the physical attack uh, part of it and cyber and uh, using uh, tools and everything from Amazon um, only tools from Amazon. He told us how they were able to break into every substation that they were hired to break into with no problem at all. And uh, I said, well, what about the SIP standards from uh, NERC? And he said, well, once they get the minimum standards done, they just check it off the box and they're done. So it wasn't at all. All right, help me out here. Are you talking about cyber break-ins or are you talking physical? Well, they they have a team that actually does break-ins into physical, like into substations. So, the you know, uh, years ago after Medcalf, uh, um, FERC and NERC came up or NERC came up with uh, uh, standards, SIP standards, because you got to understand in those substations, there's also housing that is like Ethernet hubs because it's all controlled by Internet. So if you break into there, you also have some cyber access to the grid itself because it is a smart grid. So they were able to break into all those, all the ones they were hired to break into. And uh, again, when I interviewed Jim Robb, it was like, well, you know, they never just do the minimums, but that's not true. That's exactly what they do. I mean, um, he talked to the people who were actually um, uh, doing it and the the managers and and they just check the box off that it's done and then they move on. Not all of them, but, but the majority of them do. So even physical threat is still a bigger threat and even and with drones now it's an even bigger threat because if you look at what happened what the iranians did in saudi arabia uh, uh, attacking aramco over there and um other attacks and 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 so physical attacks are are part of it but what they would probably do is a combined attack anyway cyber physical everything emp they view emp as a cyber weapon by the way yeah, exactly. They don't look at it as a nuclear weapon. No. They actually claim it's a cyber weapon, even right. if off by a nuke. Right. To them, that's not nuclear war because they're not, you know, that's dropping right. on your head. But the long term effect is worse. I mean, that's right. One, one low grade weapon, just like the, the optimum size is the kind of weapon that's been developed in North Korea. A lot of people don't realize that. Right. Rapid stuff North Korea's developed. But you could also, th- those are small, you put them on satellites. You can do fractional orbital yep. climate. You could have one yep. on a satellite just fly overhead, and the day you decide to set it off, boom. Well, there's two of those going overhead right now from North Korea every day. 
I mean, there are two satellites that they put up in the same orbit that was used and developed by the Russians for their uh, practical frac frac what is it practical bombardment orbital bombardment no that's a lot so <laughs> they they developed the satellites and the reason they come from the south is because all of our missile defenses are in the in the north in Alaska and Canada and everywhere else we have nothing to protect us from the south so they before at least they couldn't really shoot them down now maybe but we don't really still know what's in those satellites. There's no way to know. They could just be going overhead and you would have no warning of an EMP. That's, that's all too true. All too true. Now, a lot of people don't realize too is that uh, we have other vulnerabilities like uh, they, the North Koreans had a cargo ship, that's, uh, what they called a tramp steamer that called the Chang Chang Gang Right around in the Gulf of Mexico and the Caribbean, yeah, it was caught coming back through the uh, Panama Canal after it already been out here running around. They got in a hurry to get it back for some reason, so they thought they had a chance getting it through the canal. And they did an inspection on the ship buried under a lot of sugar in the cargo hold. They found two fully erect missile launchers. Uh, the, the, the missiles were on the launchers. Everything was set up underneath all that sugar. Those things could have been sitting on the deck of that boat in some kind of practice trial runs, and we just didn't know it. And this happened at the same time, roughly, this ship was in that area. At the same time, one of those satellites first went over America, and it was when, uh, and that was the same day that the Metcalf attack took place. It's 2014. Really believed, yeah. yeah. It's really believed that they would do a multi-pronged attack if they could come at us, that it would be, you know, cyber, physical, uh, many other, you know, uh, missile, maybe satellite, uh, and a lot of people are thinking intercontinental ballistic missile, but it could be an interim range ballistic missile. Well, yeah, and the, the reason that's attractive to them is because, I mean, the, they call it a scud and a tub because they could take a lot lower power missile. It doesn't have to be a, an intercontinental ballistic missile. And the Russians actually developed technology that these things sit in a uh, transfer truck um, can, uh, container container truck so when you see all these ships coming into all these ports with all these containers on them they have uh full systems that the russians have been selling for 15 years all over the world that they just pop up out of the back of it and they could fire uh, a missile and then you don't really know there's no retaliation because you don't know what country fired it from what country fired it it came from the gulf or the middle of the atlantic or or it's not attributable to the Russians or the Chinese or anybody. So it would be a lot harder for them to, to do a counterattack. Exactly. And one of the, one of the scenarios, I mean, a lot of people like Apri and uh, you know, they put this one little dot over the middle of the country. And then they say that, you know, um, that an EMP wouldn't take down certain things uh, because of the field of the EMP. Well, an adversary that's going to attack us, especially with a scud and a tub, type scenario would send up probably four or five EMPs and you know they wouldn't have to go as high if they sent up four and five too and you know if they took down the east coast pretty much I mean I think two-thirds of the population is in the on the east coast I believe and so it would uh, there are a lot of scenarios and if if they hit us it'll it'll be something we're not expecting too oh yeah absolutely uh but think about this. If you go south of our country where we've got our vulnerable underbelly that we're not monitoring, there is a nation that's failed nation. It's called yeah. Venezuela. Venezuela. Failed yeah. nation. Anything can be going on in and around Venezuela because that's you know pretty much unregulated. But who's playing in Venezuela? We yep. have Russia, yep. China, North Korea, and Iran. They're all there in Venezuela. They just stopped a ship last week, I believe it was, an Iranian ship that was uh, transferring gas so, last yeah. week from Venezuela. So if somebody went to Venezuela and did a uh, launch offshore from a scud in a tub, you wouldn't know who it came from. So there's a plausible deniability. How do you uh, attack you know, a country when you don't know who it is, who it was? It might not even have been a country. Absolutely. Uh, so, you know, some terrorist group, you know, it's said that there's 80 loose backpack nukes 
Uh, who knows what came out of the Soviet Union when they were falling apart. The key, the hard part from the, from the bill is the triggering devices. But we know that even though Iran claims they don't have enough uranium enriched yet to make a, a, a weapon, we know that they have uh, the ability to do the triggers. And they also trade with North Korea, uh, who has the materials. And it's, I have heard a long time ago that when Kazakhstan fell, that uh, Iran actually got two full-scale ICBMs with, with the warheads. So uh, hmm. what they actually have is a good question. Um, well, and they share technology, too. I mean, if you go to the launches in uh, North Korea, there were always Iranians there and vice versa. Yeah. Well, al Qaeda Khan was the father of the Pakistan. Pakistan, yep. And al Qaeda Khan actually was selling this stuff all over the Middle East and elsewhere, the technology systems. He was making a lot of money with that. Uh, and including, uh, you know, Libya started the system, but uh, when we started hitting other countries, uh, Muammar Gaddafi got scared and he shut us down. We still he still got taken out, even though he uh, <laughs> shut his stuff down, so it didn't do him any good. That might have been a lesson to the other guys. Hey, we don't want to shut down. We saw it happen to Muammar Gaddafi. You get whacked, you know, so why do we want to stop producing this stuff? Uh, right. Now, some people go, yeah, well, it takes a major power to attack or do something like that. I'm going to show people something. It doesn't. Yeah. I'm going to give them a little perspective of something I was doing 20 years ago. <laughs> uh, so I hope this don't, I'm going to go into full screen mode here again. I hope it don't cause us the issue it did earlier. Uh, and where are you in there? I don't see I you. am right here. That is me. Hey, where's your beard and your hair? <laughs> all that back then. This is a <laughs> recent phenomenon of me. <laughs> and this is just in a garage workshop building. Here's a rock a hybrid fuel grain is in here. Here's a nozzle. And we were uh, measuring out the fins. We had this is a garage workshop basically. Wow. We, this is a small team of guys working late night toward midnight, you know, building a rocket. This was our electronics shop that we had in another garage. This was one of our rockets uh, on actually the Pearl River barge in the Gulf of Mexico. Now wow. that was, this was a club rocket. This was the Halo SL2 rocket. By the way, that rocket hangs today in Huntsville in a place called the Straight to L Brewery from the cellar. <laughs> this was a balloon that we, <clears throat> that we had developed. Now you can put these devices on balloons that get up 20 miles high and they will cover uh, about an area with a radius of, you, know, you could cover a diameter of 800 miles from a balloon with an EMP. This wow. was our balloon launch return vehicle. We, we were developing rocket powered UAVs. And you can see the center, we launched one of those from a boat. And this was launched from a boat called the C. Michael Calais, which I rented from a, a, a company down the, operating out of Homa, uh, Louisiana, a utility boat. And though, there it is. And that little tuff of blonde hair where my cursor at, that's me right there. That's <laughs> our uh, balloon launch return vehicle. And this was wow. uh, Mike Smith, the head of uh, what with them was, uh, it's now Aerostar. What was it, what altitude would those rockets go to? Well, we got uh, in the Guinness Book World Records one launch from the shore. We could, you could hit the common line. You can hit space with rockets like that. Wow. This was our cheap access to space rocket. This one was 17 and a half foot long. Uh, yeah, a rocket like this could go uh, 100 miles up. Or, uh, so you could definitely get uh, enough altitude with a device like that. And this is on the back of uh, a boat, a utility boat known as the Mr. Offshore. I don't believe that boat is operational today. This was in the year 2000. This is what I was doing 20 years ago. 20 years ago, I could hit the edge of space from operating out of two garages, something that it took a superpower to do just a hand, a, one finger, you know, a handful of decades ago. We built devices and electronics back then with the old stuff that we had. Uh, 20 years ago that it could defeat the COCOM limits so we could use civilian GPS for, for navigation. This was our launch box that we had on it. Wow. If you had a Bella so you wouldn't have contact until it got over a certain altitude, Bella switches. So it couldn't inadvertently fire on us and blow us up. <laughs> we had four ground thing. stations to triangulate and tracking this stuff. Oh my goodness. But we did all this out of a, uh, you know, a shoestring budget basically. Oh, that's the uh, the EM. Starfish Prime. That's the Starfish Prime right yep. there. By the way, that was launched from a Redstone rocket, which is developed uh, here in Huntsville, Alabama area too. It rests on Arsenal. So, uh, just give people an idea. These are the kind of things we're capable. Of. I amazing. led this stuff. This I was in charge of these programs. This is wow. what I was doing 20 years ago on the side. I had a day job. 
I was doing space <laughs> station work and during the day and at night I was building rockets. So, <laughs> but it just goes to show you, I mean, it, it was somebody with, with the resources of a nation state, even if it's a small nation state, what do you think they could build? That right? is my point right there. That is the point. I um, mean, we even have states you don't really think about. Limited really? resources, limited time. of just a handful of guys working part-time on a shoestring budget, and we were doing what used to take the superpower to do. Right. Um, it, you know, that was a major accomplishment. So that really told me a lot about technological proliferation and what was possible. So that tells me that we have vulnerabilities here that a lot of people just can't appreciate. When I, Absolutely. You know, I know how to send devices up. I mean, if I had uh, one of the, you know, one of the nukes, I could definitely put it in position. Right. I, I developed that technology 20 years ago. The technology <laughs> well, and the operational techniques on how to develop them. I was yeah, doing well, that kind of stuff. I just <laughs> did that in the purpose. Well, and, and when people, what people didn't realize the whole time that uh, uh, back in 2017, when everybody was worried about North Korea, you know, you have these experts, even nuclear experts saying, well, you know, they have a missile, but they don't have the proper skin for reentry and they can't be very accurate. And well, with an electromagnetic pulse in the atmosphere, they don't need either of those. Bingo. And, and a lot of their tests were they would go up and they would blow up at about the uh, correct altitude for an EMP blast. And everybody kept saying, oh, well, that's a mistake. It just went up and blew up. Well, I mean, yeah, they want you to think it was a mistake. <laughs> that's that was right. Awesome. That was the target, people. I mean, and especially with North Korea, it is in there. And he, he even during that time, Kim Jong Il uh, referenced EMP several times. So, so they have the technology. Yes, they do, because that was another thing the Soviet generals told us. They told us that the, they gave yep. the technology to the North Koreans. They told us that. So we know North Korea. Yes. Technology. So. Right. When you look at that, when, uh, when you look at, you know, what it could be done from a Chung Chung gang type ship, absolutely you could launch this kind of stuff. I mean, absolutely. I've done it. I've been out there launching stuff. I've launched rockets. Right. I've launched balloons. I've done it in the ocean. I did it where I could put, I can make it rocket run. And so the the, the uh, ship run in such a way that I knew how the winds of the loft would go. So I could actually have that balloon in any point in the sky I wanted it to. I mean, the exact coordinates. Uh, right. for the time Amazing. that plane, uh, that rocket should launch. And so, uh, you know, all we had to do was change the run into the boat because we knew how long it would take to inflate that balloon. And so I'd have, well, the winds are off. We could map it all out so that when I was ready to launch that balloon, we would be at the point it would take for that balloon to get to a certain point in the sky. We've done that. And, <laughs> and we well, that was 20 years ago, now. right? 20 Maybe. years ago. 20 years ago. I mean, and wow. So what could you do today? And we didn't have all the electronics. I mean, gosh, mighty cell phones have electronics could do more. Than oh my gosh. We were developing back then. We were doing from scratch. I mean, there's so much available to people today. Uh, so the scary thing is I know how to do that, but I also know how to penetrate the, the, the transformer stations and what the vulnerabilities to be. You right. know, there's nothing to brag about, but if I know it, you know, I'm not the only guy out here. There's right. tons of electrical engineers yes. and there's tons of people who are both electrical engineers and have been in the military like myself. Who right. understand operations and tactics and how to do things. So, yes. and, and there's a lot of foreigners who you go to any college in the United States of America. My dean of, of electrical engineering in the school I was at was Iranian. No, he just, I don't think so. He's a really nice guy. Right. But, but you just don't know. You know, you get how yeah. many persons do we have in America? How many people are there? Well, uh, and we have a huge I, problem with the Chinese, the same problem. We have so many Chinese students and, and and uh, I, I'm glad they finally are addressing this. It's not, and, and it's, the, it's the Chinese Communist Party. It's not, not the Chinese people, but, Bingo. but, you know, they have agents here. I mean, they've infiltrated our universities and our, our labs and, and, and our, our whole uh, education system. I mean, they stole our plans. An engineer stole our plans to our current stealth fighter and passed it on to them. And I believe that's how they developed their J-21. I mean, they, they have infiltrated our entire system. And, uh, right. but yet they've controlled, tightly controlled how any, uh, anybody with any commerce in their system uh, could have access. I mean, because we're a free country, 
they have unfettered access in a lot of ways that we would never have there. We're forced to give them our technology and, you know, corporations really just uh, in the last 20 years have been willing to do just about anything to get the Chinese market. And that's why we've had the problems we've had with them. We're wide open to them. And I'm glad that uh, the current administration has finally seen that because if we wait 10 years down the road to address these things, it'll be too late. Oh yeah. I, I did note in your trailer, you showed the DF 21. Uh, yes. I, I just mentioned that in the video I had. Like yes. My videos, I talked about the DF 21, the DF 26. Uh, yeah. And we talk about the hot spots. I mean, because that's, that's part of the problem is that it only takes them deciding to invade Taiwan or it only takes Kim Jong-il to have a bad year and his whole country's about to fall down. Well, then that's when they strike out. That's when any of these countries strike well, that's, out. That's where China is right now. So right. Here's, here's what and, I'm saying, David. Here's why I'm concerned. China right. has had floods going on for months, both the Yangtze yep. River and the Yellow River. The Yangtze River Valley produces 40% of the food, food. in China, 40%. Yep. The Yellow River Valley produces another good chunk. Both have been severely flooded. They're having locusts coming in the country, and they're having summer snows in, in some of their western uh, districts, which is, you know, is unheard of. And they even had a couple of little snowfalls in Beijing, of all places. So, wow. Um, well, that's why they bought some of our agriculture products. You know, yeah. We were thinking it was because they wanted to trade. No, it's because they actually needed them. Well, they actually bought record amounts before all this stuff started. They right. had a record purchase before uh, the bug that's running around uh, got right. out. Uh, don't even go you know, into that. We can, <laughs> yeah, I don't want to ask why I'm being real cryptic in how I'm saying this, because talking on this platform yes. is it, such that you have to be careful. My, my analogy to it is it's like walking on eggshells on thin ice during an earthquake. <laughs> well, so, and and, you know, a lot of the people I interviewed, it was even worse for them because almost all of them had uh, classified clearance. And so they have a lot of what we call guilty knowledge because they know stuff that we'll never know. And they're telling us things that we should do things, but they can't make the argument argument using what they know a lot of times. Yeah, I'm aware of that. And, I know that. and that's why we need to listen to a lot of them because, and, and realize where they're coming from and what they know. Yeah. Well, some of the stuff should be declassified just so they Absolutely. Can find out. Absolutely. And that's, another, that's another way that system is making it here. It's just like what I just quoted with the, uh, uh, number on the EMP super weapons that was previously classified, but it's in the public record. Once something's on public record, it's yeah. wide open. Now yeah. I think if you go back and look that they may have excised that <laughs> in some versions, but it did get out. Right. Um, so it's, it's been out there and it's, it's, it's a scary number to think about. And a lot of, uh, uh, there are a lot of systems out there being sold that people think are going to protect their home. And I, uh, you know, they're not. Yeah. And I mean, that's, that's one of the scariest numbers because most people in Congress and most people even in government believe that our strategic systems will be protected if we get hit first by an EMP. But if we get hit by a super EMP, they won't be. Yeah, we're, not going, get, we're not going to be able to protect the mill hard standard installations. Right. Not adequately. And yeah. So how in the world some chintzy little device with no. wires on it, no bigger than a speaker wire, or no something way. like that going to protect your home <laughs> and, and some of these products claim they will we'll protect your home for up to 40 emps you no. won't cover it for one buddy but you no. know the world's gonna be fried so nobody's gonna come after you and sue you right you so yeah it's crazy what people claim uh for sure yeah well, well we had tests in the lab but yeah they had testing for a certain spectrum of things that didn't right. really shake it out shake it and make it <laughs> crazy I'm thinking I may for a video buy one and just get me a car battery and fry the crap out of it. Oh yeah. You can see how many, um, <laughs> how many volts it takes to fry it. You know, well, these things work by voltage division. I'm an electrical engineer. Let me explain that. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. So, yeah. yeah you're, the you're the man to do that. I mean, because you, you know, people don't understand that at all. And I mean, you know, even from a, from a, a, a chronial mass ejection from the sun, they estimated that, and they had data because uh, by 1921 for the railroad event, and this is another thing we cover, they had data that proved that on the telegraph lines, it was 19 kilovolts per meter, 
just from a solar storm. Yeah. And they, they even said that could have, that was almost Carrington event. It's hard to say because Carrington, we didn't have, there, were, there was no measurement really. They didn't really know what was happening. They just observed it and then kind of figured out what was happening. Whereas here we knew what it was and we were able to measure. And, um, um, a, a, uh, Dr. Jeffrey, I can't remember his last name, but he went back. He's a Harvard professor and a doctor, Dr. Jeffrey Love. And he went back and reconstructed all the accounts and everything else and uh, showed that that was how bad the 1921 storm was. And the problem is, even then, we didn't have nearly the electronics or the reliance on electricity that we have today. Everything relies on electricity. And therein lies the problem. Uh-oh. You look studious there. Yeah, I'm trying to draw a, a diagram to kind of get this across in the simplest way I can think of in a hurry on a piece of paper. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Uh, that's a symbol for a battery and this right. is kind of a switch box okay and, and it's got a, a, a wire going to ground a protective wire and that's your house basically of course all this is inside the house but this is right get the idea so what all these devices do is they 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 sense a current coming through here and they pro rapidly provide a shunt to ground but that shunt for ground is only so big and this is actually still connected if you go to all the documents that talk about these things it will tell you you still have voltage division or current division you're still going to get current going down this path too. Now, if this is at the ground, it's lower. Uh, it is a lower resistance, so it's going to get uh, more current. But you still have a lot of current going here. But when you got an event of the scale we're talking about, you're going to have enough current going there to fry your stuff anyway. Oh yeah. Uh, and something else that they don't talk about, and and you and I have seen at the power stations, you know darn well that uh, when they switch open, so there's so much stuff to talk about here. <laughs> when I was in the military, they told us an EMP device, nothing connected is safe. To totally disconnect everything. You don't even have the wires or connectors anywhere close. You had to have uh, one radio system totally disconnected in the Faraday cage because it could be fried easily. And yeah. so these guys, oh, we can protect your home just by this little box with chintzy little wires and that, that, that this will totally work. And these guys decide to sue me for saying this i'm gonna get them <laughs> Man, well, you can take their box apart then and oh, you know oh i i know oh, i know you got did that and they for that in the sun uh one uh, actually somebody you met too but um, yeah they threatened to sue him over that and he, he kind of backed down i won't back i think down. i heard that story I'll, I'll start it's amazing what you hear when you start to run in the kind of these circles you I hear these know, little stories I know about this i know about it firsthand but i'm gonna tell you what i will i will get their things and have a lot of fun with them you should. That would be an interesting uh, YouTube is for you to run a, a YouTube video to run a couple of. Uh... All right. Well, if they mess with me, that's what I'll do. <laughs> <laughs> Takes a little time. I got to spend a few bucks. But yeah, I mean, you, you know, you brought up a great point. I mean, it is, it's, that's one of the reasons. I mean, it's so difficult to edit the documentary because there's so many things that people need to actually know and understand just on a basic level to understand the problem. And there's so many threats and there are, just it's so complicated to fix the grid because you know the power grid just like the internet was never meant to be detected and now you've basically merged the power grid and the internet because without the internet they can't run the power grid now well they do have an internal internet but it's still vulnerable because but it doesn't matter the thing about yeah. stuck virus that took down yeah. the reactors that was that air was, gapped even that was off the, the yeah. main internet but some guys got in there with memory sticks they got in there with the little USB sticks. Uh, yeah. Somebody get, got in there with one that had the, the, the stuck snicks virus on it. That's it, right. And bam, off they went. So yep. that's all. That's easy not. to do. I mean, these and, the security at these power facilities is nothing. So I mean, that could happen in Iran, who had high, oh my gosh. high security, and it's not an open society. Right. What would happen in our country? To an underground facility. I mean, you know, and we just talked about, yeah, I don't want to go into specifics about that, but yeah, it could easily happen. So and, uh, yeah, there's a lot we need to do to get our grid hardened, but it can be done. We have the technology yes. and if we can just, if we, if we can just have enough to keep uh, basic essential systems running and keep the, uh, uh, the transformers, the big transformers, the large transformers. transformers. We want to save them. Yeah, and we we want to be able to keep cooling water to the uh, nuclear plants. And absolutely, 
it may be that you park a barge, a uh, fuel barge right there next to the uh, power plants, or, or you may have trains come in as backup generators, uh, because you know, they have big electrical generators. There's several things you can do that aren't that hard. You, uh, having National Guard escorts for fuel convoys, Right. Uh, you know, uh, a fuel convoy is going to you know, think about Mad Max or a uh, movie. Uh, that's <laughs> what happened in Venezuela. You've already had Mad Max get the fuel truck, you know? Yeah. Uh, and well, and it's, it's, it's crazy though, because of the nuclear regulatory commission. Uh, I mean, that's going to be difficult because anytime you do anything to a nuclear plant, it's so expensive and it's so, I mean, they, they have so many rules and everything that, um, you know, that govern that for good reason. But, but to make sure in a power, a situation where the power goes out and the pumps can't keep the, the, uh, the cooled ponds or the, the ponds where they keep the spent uh, fuel cool, um, you know, they, they need to address that. And they also need to address, I don't know if you talked about this because we lost connection, but, you know, the federal government actually... Once a uh, fuel rod is spent, they put it in the cooling pool for five years, correct? So they've got these huge pools with the spent fuel in there. So the government and their wisdom came in and they were putting them, they were, they were supposed to do Yucca Mountain so they would have a place to put the uh, um, nuclear rods in dry storage. But when that never happened, they started storing all the nuclear rods and dry storage on location. Right. Now, that's fine, really, because they were safe. Like at Fukushima, they didn't have a problem with any of those. But then what the federal government did when they started getting the bill for the power companies to put the spent fuel in dry storage after five years, they made a rule that your spent fuel pool had to be totally full before you moved anything to dry storage. And that's the problem. And by and, the way, all the fuel rods aren't spent because fuel rods that are destined to go into the reactor are staged right. through the spent fuel rod pool. So there's some very hot fuel rods in those spent fuel rod pools too. Well, just sheet metal roof. For yeah, a sheet metal roof. I mean, you know, they spend billions of dollars on the four foot thick concrete <laughs> containment. And then they put all this, they put what, five, 10 times the radioactive waste next door in a shed. You so know, it's crazy. Talks, everybody talks about the reactors and being afraid the reactors going off. And that's of concern, but I don't even talk about the reactors because everybody else focuses on it and they, they, they neglect the spent fuel rod poles. They have more right. stuff in them. <laughs> right. More stuff in the spent fuel rod poles and they're far more dangerous than the grid. Absolutely. Goes. Well, yeah. look at Fukushima. I mean, they didn't, again, they didn't have any problems with the contained nuclear uh, material. Well, see, too, you, what people don't realize is that if the operators are really smart, and I said if, and if's a big two-letter word, <laughs> if they inject boron in and real heavily in that reactor, as soon as they know that everything's gone down, they can stop that reactor, at least from the reaction process. You still got all the heat and the radioactive material in there. It's still right. might build them. At least you can stop the reaction. Yeah. Now, that didn't happen in Fukushima. It didn't happen in the instance we had because they're always afraid they're going to wreck the plant. But it would save the country if they right. did it. So they need to really uh, be prepared to eject that boron into those reactors. Into 99 reactors. Yeah, well, that's what they need to do. 99. And then that can be done. They've got the stuff to do. Yeah. It's all there and ready to go. And right. the problem is they may not know what's just happened. They may yeah. think they're just having a storm and power got knocked out. They may not know. And uh, they may lose power to control their systems before they even react properly. So the right. re that's the danger in the reactor. So we do need better intel uh, available to them so we can find, figure out what's happened so they can react properly. So that's Absolutely. part of what needs to be on the sensor side of what we got running. We have a very complicated country. A lot of people don't realize just how complicated all this stuff is. I cover a home. I have, bring Greg is a homesteading channel, and and prepping, and this is an element of prepping. But uh, a lot of people think, well, we should just shut the grid down. We'll all be fine. We'll all be used to. <laughs> the problem is, is you can't because you're going to get fried from the radiation. Right. And, and, and you can't restart it. I mean, yeah. you can't just restart the grid, especially because you would have no communication. And to restart the grid, you have to have communication because you don't just turn it on. It has to be balanced and things have to start up in order. 
and you have to black start things and you have to have power to even restart a nuclear power plant. So there are so many complicated problems to restarting the grid, you which is, which is what gets me why the power industry has gone to kind of that's the plan yeah. is restarting. And I just don't think that, you know, even for a CME, they talked about bringing the grid down for a period of time because they would have, you know, anywhere from 15 minutes to an hour's notice if a bad CME was coming in. But, you know, by the time their planning would say that the president or the Department of Energy would have to make that decision. So now imagine the phone ringing, that coming in, and then them getting the information out to everybody in, say, if it was only 15 minutes to shut down the grid. I mean, it's just, and what is the procedure? I mean, it's just, there's so many things and it's so complicated. The power grid is the you most know, complicated machine that man has ever built. And nobody's period. addressing it. And you're exactly right. The reason it's so complicated is saying that it's actually a multitude of grids. Yeah, absolutely. A multitude of co companies. So you 3, have companies that produce the power. And then you've got tons of companies that distribute the power from the producers. Right. And they all have to work in concert and together. Because here's the secret. The, the, Entire power grid produces at any and every instant in time the exact amount of energy that's being consumed. That, right. that is, that's amazing. That's amazing. I People mean, are like, oh, where does it store? Like if they make it and we don't need it yet. No, no that's not the way it works. <laughs> exactly. They produce exactly. At Which is amazing. It's amazing. Well, and, and they coordinate this across yeah. 3,000 companies. It's amazing. A multitude of grids that are all interconnected. And it is absolutely amazing. You're exactly right. Of course, the more we uh, modernize this and make it smarter, <laughs> the more vulnerable we are. So how smart is a smart grid? How smart are your smart meters? And these absolutely. Are all, the more smartness you build into it, the easier it is to fry it. So, yeah. <laughs> So, the dumber it gets when something happens. Yeah. Bingo, exactly. <laughs> the smarter it is, the dumber it is when it loses its brain. Well, it just makes us more vulnerable. And unfortunately, you know, our enemies know it and have it in their military plans again. And so I'm it's laughing, it's man. just, yeah, it, we've built our whole country on, on, on something that uh, Frank Gaffney, uh, he had a name for it. I can't, I can't remember right off, but it was just like, it's like just a mess. I mean, it's, it's amazing because a lot of the infrastructure for the power grid is a hundred years old. Yeah, it is. That's I good. mean, it's been just added on and added on and it's, it's ad hoc built. A lot of the, lot, your transformers are custom built for wherever they're at. The coils are hand wound and uh, all this has to work together in concert, like a perfect machine. It's an orchestra. <laughs> yeah, it is. And I mean, it's, it's amazing. It is amazing that you flip that you, that you flip the switch and power comes on because I mean, and the power companies do an amazing job yes, providing us with cheap power and, and resilient power. But they, unfortunately, they just haven't addressed the, the biggest threat. And I think it's, and, and honestly, I think it's because it's just too overwhelming for them. I think that they just melt when they try to think of, all of it, because they really, not only are they, when they're fighting the cyber threat, the EMP threat and the physical threat are, are different. You have to do different things to the grid. Cyber is totally removed from EMP. So they're right now, they're spending all their money on cyber. Yeah, they and are we just did, cyber. That's, and they are covering that as best as they can. Yeah, but so, it's never going to be covered. I mean, and I'll tell you something. You're, gonna that, holes. You're always going to have holes in that. Well, and they don't understand the threat from cyber even. I just interviewed George Cotter, who was the former technical lead for the NSA. And uh, he shared with me that, you know, uh, because I asked Jim Robb, the head of NERC, about the threat to, from cyber. And he said, well, you know, they could never take down the national grid with cyber because it's so contained and there's so many different systems and everything. And so I was always, I was like, well, maybe he's got a point, but but then I go talk to the former technical lead of the NSA and they say, well, they just don't understand the threat. Yeah. Has he talked to the Iranians yet? <laughs> <laughs> right. They just don't well, appreciate and understand the threat. They can think that. So that's the kind of thinking you have going on. But well, again, I think it's, I think it's. Dismissive cognitive dissonance. That, oh, well, we got this. Yeah. We got dismissive. This. Okay. Dismissive. And, and, well, low probability dismissive, but, but they're spending, think of how much money they're spending trying to protect the grid. I mean, just from cyber attacks, it's, it's, 
It's incredible. Well, I believe I could take down the grid myself if I was so <laughs> idiot to do that, but I would never do it because that's idiot. Right. But, and, you know, there's a, several people out here that can do that in, in this country. Yeah. A lot of them aren't as magnanimous as I am. <laughs> yeah. Well, and the, the bad thing is our enemy, you know, we, we have smart enemies and they know that uh, most of them know that our military is great and they could never take us on head to head to militarily, but they could sure hit our infrastructure yeah, and hit our Achilles heel. Here's how they do it. If a country wanted to attack this country, everybody said, well, they won't do it because we'll, we'll fire our ICBMs back at them. And, and if they take out our grid, they'll, they'll, we'll shoot them from the submarines. What they don't realize is this. When you get something that's, that's, that's more powerful than your installation hardening requirements, and, uh, and again, you're going to have several of these hit, and you're going to have also direct ballistic attacks or by, by people going in with AK-47s or whatever. Uh, Drones. There's other ways to do that, too, by the way. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. Like well, there are suitcase EMP weapons, direct there's energy EMP weapons. weapons. There's backpack news. There's right. satellite tracks, order of environment, the scuds in the tub. There's right. environmental ballistic missiles. There are so many ways to take down the grid with EMP, the ballistic attacks, direct kin uh, kinetic attacks, I mean, with uh, cyber. When you put all that together. Uh, and, but that's something they never want to do. They never want to put it all together, which in real life would happen. It would be put all together. They just want oh. to take one little piece of one little thing and then say it's low probability. So if you're a military planner on the other side and you decide you want to hit the United States, right? You would, your first objective, your number one first objective is to take down the power grid. Our military bases run off the civilian power. 95%. Power. Yeah, yep. 95%. So when you take that down, plus you're, 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 you're hit, overloading them with EMP devices that exceed their hardening standard. And believe you me, they will probably have those suitcase devices really close to those military bases with, uh, you know, people they've already got prepositioned here in this country. So they're going to hit it every way they possibly can. Yep. So once they take down that stuff, how does this country communicate and respond? How does it respond? The guys even in silos, if their silo is working, missile silo, they can't launch without command. Uh, if their stuff is working, how's the communication network going to work? Will their stuff work? Uh, will well, and even supply work? chain. I mean, if they, if they, if the bases that are protected, which are very few, very, very few strategic bases are, are um, protected from an EMP blast, even if they were, if all the other bases are down, they have no supply. They have no food. They have no. Well, I'm thinking, yeah, that's the support at all. Immediate response. So I'm right now. I'm thinking, if you're, you're the other side, you want to hit America, you don't want a whole lot of stuff coming at you. How right. do you minimize that so that the, the, they can't shoot back with their immediate response? I mean, if, if you've got ICBMs, you could, at least, you could have them targeted and on their way here before they, they get to the point our radars would see them. Especially but with the scud in the tub, they wouldn't even know who shot it. So you couldn't no, well, retaliate. Would, yeah, and would, a cyber attack combined, yeah, you would not know who did it. That'd be true for the MP side, but they want to take out our missile bases. I and mean, the guys are going to be shaking yeah. head first on what happened, who would it come from. And while they're trying to figure that out, the stuff's on the way that would take them out completely. Uh, well, that's it, why it, our space-based defenses are so important, don't you think? Them. Exactly. Yes, I agree with that. Um, you know, I'm, you know, I, you know, I really, truly, I wish we didn't have to have a standing army and I wish that we didn't have to have all this stuff. Uh, but uh, if, when it comes to defending our grid, in our country, in the world we live in today, we have a, a very aggressive country, a couple of countries out there who uh, view us in less than favorable light right now. And they're at that point where their internal uh, politics may go south in a hurry, given yep. inadequate food, uh, economic issues, and, and a lot of other things that's happening internally. And typically in a situation like that, a lot of people don't understand, especially in tyrannical government, they don't think like us. And Absolutely not. Rational. See, everybody no. makes assumptions about these companies based on, or countries based on rationality and Western thinking. They do not think like that at all. At all. They, they don't trust us. They think that we would really hit them first. And two, mm -hmm. they, uh, they are only interested in maintaining the power they have. They don't even care about their own citizens. If they did, you wouldn't see uh, uh, some countries like the CCP making decisions to blow levees and dams right. at times that, aren't, uh, that are not announced because if they announced they were going to do it and the people knew the flood was coming and get out, then they'd have to pay the insurance cost. 
Right. That's just really strange. That's supposed to be a, a classless society. You know, yeah, right. Um, you know, it's amazing. It's I mean, and, and just, and the, the, the thing is that the, you know, China and Russia use, if they don't want to do something themselves, they just use North Korea and Iran as proxies. Easily. And Easily. they'll continue so, to do that. So they, they pass on sure. technology that they yeah. want them to have. Yeah, they could stare at one of them and, 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 and make them do something while they're far removed at that point. Right. Uh, so we might know or, or know that the Chinese and the Russians are gone or not anywhere near, say, Venezuela, for example. Right. Uh, I, I pick on that because I thought sometime back that would be the optimum place if somebody was going to launch at us right now. And then along comes this lady from Wisconsin who has this dream, a vision, uh, that about EMP devices being launched from two missiles coming out from offshore from Venezuela. And really? MP Blast. How now, weird. She grew up on a farm. She works on a farm. She had no clue what an EMP was. So here she came up with a dream that saw EMP devices. She didn't know what it was until she started researching this dream and looking this stuff up. And mm. it was like perfect uh, tactical operation, you know, how you would do a sneak attack which usually a lot of you military planners don't even think about this kind of stuff. But here's a lady who works milking cows. who saw all this. I'm, mm. I've had her on my channel. It's like, interesting. Wow, you saw what? You saw what? And she went into all the details. It's like, holy smoke. I mean, would you believe in that kind of stuff or not? That is just off the chart. How did she come up with that? Wow. Yeah, very I, strange. I go around to military planners and say, how would you state something like this if you wanted to do it? And I don't want to get that answer from them. I already know that. So yeah. right, she's, she milks cows for a living. And she's got a, 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 a you know, market farm garden uh, uh, farm. And uh, she has a YouTube channel. And, and it's a uh, prepper gardening type YouTube channel. Huh. Interesting. And, uh, and she saw this. And it's like, wow. The lady really has impressed me. I've got her involved in a little outfit I'm starting called the Future Freedom Foundation. Our motto is to... Don't tread on freedom. <laughs> it's a good motto. I like it. And for anybody wanting to join that, they can email me. Right now, I haven't set up the website. We're just starting the group. We've got people in various states around the country right now. But anybody who wants to do that, they can email my old Space Society uh, email right now. Uh, and I'll get the other site set up soon. hal 5 space at AOL.com. Put freedom in the uh, subject line. I'm also starting a network of uh, survival tribes because you can't make it as a lone prepper. Uh, if you're interested in that, put uh, put tribe in the subject line. Now, some people put both because some people are interested in both. So we're trying to organize the prep people to get ready because if this does, she her in her dream she saw that happening this December. Given the events going on in the world today, that's plausible. I'm not going to say it's going to happen. Greg Allison not get on here and say, hey, we're going to get right. it. And, I, and I'm not But it's plausible. Anything. I did not say that anything that we're talking about is absolutely going to happen. But we it's need to happen. be ready for it if it does happen, only because it could be a civilization-ending event. Yeah. And, and we should be ready for that. These are I mean, plausible, to protect ourselves. But yeah. there is one event that will happen sooner or later. If we and don't that's a CME. Think yeah. The sun will get us. If we don't get ready, and we're not yep. ready for that right now. Yeah. Um, so we last one that hit was 1921 bad, but you know, we also had a solar storm in Quebec, uh, that took out the Quebec grid at what about 19, 89, 89, 89. 89. And that got the power companies. That's, that's the thing that started, um, that got their attention and, and look at how long it took them to come up with standards that were even substandards weren't even implemented uh as standards until i believe 2014 and they aren't scheduled to be put into the grid until 2026 i believe <laughs> and there's there's no protection i mean and and again when we interviewed jim rob oh well there's protection we have procedures well that's not going to protect the procedures will not protect the grid and and from an okay. so an I'm electromagnetic sure. pulse from the sun is an EMP three. The pulse three is the same you would get from, from an H EMP. So it wouldn't take out small devices, but it would take out all those transformers we've been talking about. So I work in avionics system safety on rocket systems. Wow. And we have a order of precedence for how to control hazards. 
And the first thing is to prevent it from design. Come up with a design that will not allow the hazard to happen in the first place. The second order is to design stops and other things to, to, to keep it from going to the full extent of what it could happen at. Uh, and you want, in, in some systems, you want to have redundancy. If you can have redundant systems where if one goes down, you got to back up to, to cover you, then you do that. Some places that don't make sense. So you build right. a fine margin, you make things thicker. Like you can only have a, your, your, your nozzle on your rocket can only be, you know, you only got one nozzle. You can't, it don't do any good to build another nozzle or a second nozzle. If you have two nozzles, then you have less reliability because the higher the parts count, you, you, you get less reliability. Uh, reliability is inversely proportional to parts count. So you got to play all these things together and figure out how to do these things. But uh, design margin is you make the wall thicker, you know, so there's different, like, maybe you have uh, in a wire to keep it from getting burned up. You know how much current it will carry. Well, you need design margin on top of that, make it thicker. Uh, especially if you got to worry about an MP, right? <laughs> <laughs> Go to your house and look at uh, what's coming out of your junction box for that ground wire, that little copper wire that goes to the ground in case you get hit by lightning. It's good to carry a certain amount of current, but it's not good enough to carry what you'd get from the MP super weapon. Right. Uh, and that's what some of these devices would rely on. I would say you better add some fair beads in there, but if you're thinking it's going to cover your house 42 times or even one time for a full-up event, you're dreaming. No way. Chances yeah. are these stuff, these stuff's going to come in through your wires and burn your house down. I would say the best defense you can have is go off grid. <laughs> right. Well, I go mean, off. in like in twenty one in the Carrington event and in the nineteen twenty one storm, the CME caused fires in uh, train stations that were connected to the telegraph lines. Right. So, I mean, imagine what would happen today. We're all connected to the telegraph lines. That's I mean, to the power lines. Yeah, that's why the 21 event was called the railroad event. Right. Uh, the Carrington event caused a lot of telegraph stations to catch on fire. And back right. in those days, they weren't running wires through the walls like our houses today. They had a hole in the wall with the insulator. It came there. straight in. You know, it came straight in onto a table yeah. and back out the other side. It wasn't yeah. like you didn't have all these wires running through all your walls and ceilings and floors like we do today. So. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, and, uh, I was going to make another point. I was going to make another okay. point. Think about this with our power stations. You know, when, when they switch power, when they open the circuit, and when they got a high a current, when they open that circuit, they have a breaker that throws like 30 feet, 20, 30 feet. And when they separate this thing, and you can see it open it up, what do you see? A lightning arc. An arc, yeah. With it for like 20 feet, maybe. Oh, my well, God. How is having a little device switching this far <laughs> apart going to have No. Because the the the, the, the dielectric uh, was standing uh, voltage, I mean, the air can't handle it. The air will break down. You'll get a breakdown of the uh, air, and the avalanche breakdown is what you call it, and it will jump. And you ever see a spark gap generator? Yeah. They're, they're, yep. they're just like that. Pop, 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 pop. And, you know, that's why even the switch that's this far apart is going to jump. You know, that's what the right. in the Army. You know, there's no switch big enough to cover you. Right. But you can't just open it up, and it's going to be okay. So well, that's it. so, and, and the thing shut it to the ground, but you're still going to have voltage division. Some of it's going to jump. Absolutely, and I mean with a with a HEMP or a nuclear EMP. I mean, so you have three pulses, and the second pulse we're the most protected against because it's the most like it's the most akin to what we would you know lightning. But, I mean, even that would be so much more power powerful than what we currently have in houses and breakers. I don't know that, that, that even from pulse two, now the E2 is far would be stronger than a regular lightning. Right. So, uh, so yeah, you got to deal with the E1, E2 and E3 all together in the M. Yeah. So that's, it's, that's the scary one. They're all scary, but that's the really scary one because it would also be combined with the cyber and everything else. And so, and that's why they've been mapping the grid for years. So they'll know exactly what they need to hit and where and when and sequences and everything. They've been mapping the grid for probably almost 10 years now, the Chinese and the Russians. So they have a very good idea of, and, and of the, what it would take. And the Iranians and the right. Iranians. I mean, the head they the don't have it to the same extent, but, but realize too, we talked about proxies before. If the Russians or the Chinese wanted something done, they just give them the the information sleeper cells too sleeper yeah cells and again, yeah. individual proxies that might walk in with a, a absolutely device. but uh i think here's something that uh, that we were told some time back and it was right. 
Someone told the head of the uh, Iranian uh, Revolutionary Guard that uh, you could take our grid down by taking out nine critical substations. That's a number that's been kicked around here in the United States. A lot of us know this in our community. It's mm -hmm. not widely known which nine to, to hit, but here's that's not power. widely known. You know, I have seen a map though. <laughs> yeah, you know, you know what his reply was? He says nine. I've already got twenty targeted. Right. And I mean, they know what the big ones are. They don't have to know the exact nine. And, and I talked to Jim Robb about that. And he yeah, said, all you gotta do is look at the dead it never happened. Graphs and see where, where the most wires are running. I mean, you know, right. Where those high voltage transmission lines are running. You can see where the substations are. It's right. It's not falling off. Of dead well, they've mapped it through, through, uh, malware that they've had in our systems for years. And, and, uh, you know, I mean, so, so they know what's where, yeah, well, the mal malware tells them what's inside the building. It tells right. them everything. So they've got a they they've got a total uh, breakdown of our system. That's the scary thing. They know yeah. Yeah, where it's at and everything about it. Well, and they've also got back doors because until I think 2014 or somewhere along in there, actually a lot of computer servers that are sitting and are still sitting on the IT side of of system security came from China. So you've still got Chinese made servers. Don't you want to connect everything together through highway and five? <laughs> so everything goes back. No, to thanks. Yeah, no, but I, you know, it, it's amazing that it took us that <laughs> this long to actually figure that out. I mean, you but know, it's, it's just so sweet. <laughs> yeah. But now it'll take 20 years for them to do anything Just about it. Just ask the if they ever, yeah. Uyghurs and the Falun Gong, how much they love the CCP. I mean, they're so great and wonderful. China, uh, Taiwan just can't wait to be integrated. Oh, yeah. All right. <laughs> well, and, yeah. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. If they were so yeah. wonderful, Taiwan and, and Hong Kong would be uh, happy campers, but they're not. Yeah. Well, Hong Kong's seeing now what happens when you put your they're trust the in people, them. The only people in the world that want a system like the, what the Chinese have is American college students. <laughs> <laughs> That's not far from the truth. Unfortunately, our, our system has been infiltrated by, by a lot of uh, far, far the, left the, the thinkers. Institutes and the it's ones, dangerous. Like yeah. The, the, these are people that don't have the real world experiences, but they're teaching yeah. stuff based on theory and they, they've lived in the ivory towers all their life. Correct. The real world operates and they de develop a lot of theoretical what's wrong with the world stuff. And there are things wrong with the world, but they absolutely, they absolutely, uh, the, their solutions are not real fixes. <laughs> not in my opinion. <laughs> well, they're, they're usually not very logical. They're mostly emotional. So, yeah. well, that's just it. You've got to use logic to really get there. I mean, you know, people's heart matters, but you know, right. you can absolutely. deal with the details of heart by looking at it from a logical standpoint, what actually works? How do you put together a system? from the economical standpoint, from a technological standpoint, sociological standpoint, they're worse. That's one of the reasons I love Peter, Dr. Peter Vincent Fry. He's awesome. Not only does he know the physics, the science, and the weapons systems, he's a weapons system expert. He's a historian. He knows the history. He historian. told us some great stories about prior civilizations yeah. who were wiped out because of their reliance on technology, and that's a great part of the documentary is him. Yeah. telling that story i uh, mean it's just really it's, he's brilliant it's, it's, I, I love talking with him he's and you know what I, I'll, I'll make i'll tell you something about a lot of these people like him who've been doing this for 20 years and they're the real warriors in this battle and they have given a lot they have been ostracized they have been uh removed from things and um you yeah, wouldn't what, believe what, how much what, they've what, given what, up what, to, what, to take this Quass, fight forward. Quass should have been the head of the space command. For big yeah, well, General Quass space was force. forced to retire basically because he disagreed with them about space command from the Air Force. You know, he he talked about it and they didn't like that. So, and that was, you know, that was tragic because he's a brilliant man. Amen, amen. Well, he's actually involved in a lot of space the space community today. The yeah, good. Advocacy community and the power grid. So well, he'll, he'll probably get more done in the private sector anyway. So <laughs> yeah, he, probably, well, he, he actually said that himself. Yeah, so, and, and that's probably true. But he's yeah. involved both in space advocacy for those who follow 
this uh, my, my Galactic Dregs channel, and right. he's involved in you know the uh, uh, space defense systems and power grid systems. He covers a lot of area. Uh, General Stephen Cross is a major, amazing individual. He is so there's smart. Another, so there's well. another group that meets in the space advocacy side uh, that's uh, headed up by, by some of my friends that uh, that uh, he's actually very much into. So kind of like uh, the Secure the Grid teleconference. But uh, so I won't go all into that, but because it's kind of a well, it's probably about a hundred of us that go to that teleconference yeah. from time to time. I'm not in that as frequently. But it's a very active group. So we have a lot of good stuff going on. The thing is, we could have a bright, brilliant future if we just hold everything together, hold this ship together, and get through these things. Right. Um, I do believe we've got to find ways to get outside of all the hatreds in the world today because technological proliferation, eventually you're going to have weapons of mass destruction capacity in the hands of small groups. And so how do you survive when you've got that? We've got to learn different ways to live and work together. But, and that's where it comes from the heart. And we've got to learn to deal with matters of the heart. But, the, but yeah. a lot of technical stuff that we just don't have right today that we've got to solve. Uh, so, and, you know, like I said, a lot of people on my Green Gig side, you know, the, we, you know we're, we're homesteaded. I got a homestead. I've got a worm farm. I got a market garden. That's what I do when I'm not doing rockets. <laughs> <laughs> but I do that too. I do yeah. missile defense. I have yeah. missile defense. I have worked space station i am working on rockets right now and i have worked on the fiery end and the sparky end too so you know right i'm I'm, uh, (laughs) well versed in the rockets yeah yeah i'm I'm a rocket man so that's cool uh, and a and a worm farmer (laughs) and And a patriot when i was a kid i built muzzle loaders (laughs) oh my gosh camping out and i'm all into wild edibles and uh you know wilderness stuff i love the wilderness i'm kind of an odd individual well, you got techno- technologically your your sound, and you got your survival skills too. So you're well, you're good at both ends because that's you know the biggest problem or another problem we have is we're losing that. All of our generations now, you know, when we grew up and and people our age, we at least knew how to uh, build a garden and had some skills that were outside of looking at a phone, pretty much. And we've lost that. I mean, we've lost a lot of the things that we know to survive that we used to know how to survive without technology. I mean, it used to be that 75% of people made, uh, um, produced our food. Now 2% produce it. So we've become so specialized. If you go on that farm today, the modern farm, they are dependent on trackers. And a lot of these big trackers use software. Right. They all use fuel. They're going to have to power grid just to get the fuel pump to get it to them. Uh, they use a lot of chemicals to, to, yeah. to grow this stuff. All that will be unavailable. These tractors yeah. will not be able to run. They're planting seed that are genetic modified seed that they have to get from the vendor, from uh, whoever, you know, Bayer, who bought Montesano out, however they have that arrangement. So they're not even allowed by their contracts to save the seed. And if they did, a lot of this hybrid seed, they wouldn't even grow back the same plant. So these farmers are completely reliant on a ginormous, distributed system that's very complex that when it goes down they won't be able to grow the food they're growing today uh you look in the the, the poultry uh houses the chicken houses the turkey houses the lay hen layer houses they use vast amounts of electricity to operate those systems uh power grows down all these birds die yeah. uh, you know they not be- to mention our distribution system our just in time food system everything's just in time look at what happened in the pandemic with our our delivery systems Oh, yeah, exactly. A lot of food was thrown away. They can keep some of this stuff uh, you know, alive as long as their backup generators are. But when they right. run the fuel, when, when you can't pump the fuel from, the, uh, from and when the trucks can't even take the fuel to, to, to the uh, fuel uh, station, gas stations, truck stops, you're, all these things are going to start compounding and cascading when right. uh, it takes a lot of spare parts and maintenance to keep the trucks running. Uh, it, when you don't have the, you can't go to the parts store. You get those parts when the mechanics uh, places aren't operating because they have a lot of power tools. Things are just going to start shattering and fraying apart. Um, that's the supply chain. It will absolutely vanish. And right. so these farmers are not going to be able to operate. And what's funny, what I've noticed, and I've done a video on this, when you go around the farms, most farmers are not gardening. Or if they do, they got a little bitty garden. Right. I went through uh, 
uh, driving around the farms doing a video once I said, no farm, no garden, no garden, no garden, no garden, no garden. And I would drive a long distance before I'd find a garden. <laughs> it's like, oh, they got a garden. Yay. No garden, no garden, no garden, no garden. No garden. Just through the farm community stuff. Then here in my area, wow. here in Georgia, a very rural, farm, huge agriculture area in South Georgia. I've been around these different areas just driving around. And I've even looked on uh, Google Earth and looked down and you don't see the garden patches. It's like, wow. I think it's like maybe 8%. No, it's not even that. About one in eight might have a garden. And a lot wow. of them are sufficient. But here's the other thing. Most people garden buying fertilizers and pesticides and all this stuff, which you got to go to the store to buy. So what I teach on my Green Gigs, Green Greg's channel is how to garden, how to build up your beds using compost, worm products, and things like that. You don't right. have to go to the store. That's the way I teach it. And I also, in my Green Greg's channel, talk about wild edibles, wild medicinals. Basically, I'm trying to get everybody to the point where they can survive, thrive, and That's stay alive, good. no matter what happens, whether our, our society keeps up and stays operating or it right. crashes and falls down. That's important. We need to be prepared either way because we live in a time of giant uncertainty. We do. We just don't know what's going to happen. We have external forces of other countries. We have in, uh, internal strife. We have... Uh, the sun will get us eventually if we don't do something. The sun will absolutely take us down if we don't do something. So, well, I mean, and, and like, uh, so when we interviewed former CIA director Woolsey, I mean, he said it's the most dangerous time that we've ever lived in because of that uncertainty and because there isn't the balance that there used to be even between us and the Russians. I mean, the nuclear umbrella, I mean, nobody liked that, but at least we prepared for that. Look at duck and cover and all that. Now nobody thinks about it. After the Cold War ended, everybody just said, oh, everything's okay now. And then we went through the little period of, of terrorism and everybody, we focused so much on terrorism that we forgot that we still have competition and strategic challenges like China and Russia out there. And uh, so now we're shifting back to that. And, yeah. and it's, it's, to see. it is unfortunate. I hope that the people in these countries where they have tyrannies running their countries will see the light and somehow uh, take, get rid of those governments that are tearing us uh, over them, get the jack yeah. bit off their neck. It's not easily done. And some of them don't really have the culture for that yet, but I hope they find the way to get there because a lot of these countries could do enormous positive things if they don't oh, yeah. on top of them. Um, there are good people in every country, every creed, Absolutely. Culture, every religion, live in every hamlet, any race, color, whatever, you will find people with good hearts, smart people, and people that work hard. Right. But Absolutely. It, it's the powers that be. That, it's the governments. Bingo. Exactly. And I would say that to the cows come home. Governments. I mean, it's like, it's not the Chinese people. It's the Chinese Communist Party. Bingo. Exactly. It's not the Iranian people. It's the crazy mullahs, you know, that are, that are so far. I mean, you know, I have no problem with it, with, uh, uh, Muslims and, and Muslim religion and it's, but it's the extremists that are, that are causing the problems and that's their Christian extremists that cause problems. Right. There are all kinds of extremists and those are the ones who are, are the problems. We have, we have had some of the best people I know are Muslim. They've got a one of the folks. Absolutely. I mean, it's a, it's a Greek restaurant that's run by a Persian guy, you know, Persian. Yeah. Iranians. Okay. Some people. Yeah. Connect with those. <laughs> yeah. But, he is the sweetest guy you'd ever meet in your life. He just, yeah, they're uh, great people. And my neighbor is Algerian, and he's a nice guy. And yeah, I got a beekeeper that comes to my place. Who's, who's, um, uh, he's uh, from Qatar, uh, uh, Gutter. How you say that? Gutter. No, he's from Gutter. So, uh, you know, I don't know people. I have worked. I've had bosses and professors from the Middle East. I had a Cuban mate from the Middle East. Uh, you know, so I have worked and dealt with these people for decades. Right. Uh, it's not the individuals. No. It's the organizations, the governments and, and organizations. There's organizations right. that cause trouble too. Because there's power in pitting people against each other. There's power in saying, it's right. their fault. It's their fault. If you support me, we'll get together and we'll fight them or fight them. And, uh, and they make us fight each other while they run everything, which is why everybody know. hates what's going on in Washington right now. Because yes. They can't play that little game anymore, yeah, you know? And, and, you know, and there's the deep state that, that seems to be arrayed against us all and global. Yeah. But, you know, what a lot of people don't right now, what would surprise some people is that you still have good people in all these agencies. And every, oh, yeah. now, and every now and then, one makes it all the way to the top. But they usually yeah. blackball once they realize this guy has either woken up or wasn't one of them to start with. <laughs> 
Well, uh, and I mean, the problem with government is, I mean, you know, I don't think the, the founders of government ever visualized people making a, pr- a career out of politics. They, you come and you serve one or two sessions and then you go back to your job, that is you know, exactly and you do what you do in life. And it's a, it's a service. It's not, you come in and you're poor and you leave and you're a multimillionaire, you know, <laughs> or shortly yeah, thereafter. They, they saw citizen, citizen uh, representatives. Right. Yeah, and they had that originally. But some of them were famous. Look, Davy Crockett, he was very much a citizen. Absolutely. He's famous, but, you know, hey, he went out and he was a soldier and he gave his life, you know, for the things he believed in. And that yep. it was Texas. But yep. he was out there. He had his sleeves rolled up. He was a frontiersman. He was, you know, out there in the frontier. And, and you had a lot of people like that. Of course, you know, uh, we had, uh, we even had a president who was pretty much like that, and Andrew Jackson. He was definitely a frontiersman. I mean, he had been a general. But he was definitely a frontier sort of guy. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we, and that's what we need to get back to. We need to get back to a government that represents the people. And that's what I'm hoping to do with Freedom Restoration Foundation. So uh, I mentioned, you know, you can, people interested in that can email me at hal5space at aol.com. I'll put a link below. So if you want to do survival tribes or join that group. And uh, I'll, at the bottom of the notes will be some stuff for uh, what you can do for the grid. And you, know, you might have stroke if you know to find that. But I'll, I'll put some contact information on here, and I'll put a link to your trailer, uh, David. Okay. Yeah, and a link to our website. It's just the Black yeah, Sky we'll Event dot com, Black and you can go there and learn. It's a, yeah, it's the Black Sky Event. So, you oh, know, and we're God. just we're just trying to get the word out. All right. So you were still developing this documentary. Uh, Correct. Is there anything anybody can do to help you? I know your story is an expensive thing to put together a documentary. What would you like to see? Could anybody help you? Well, I mean, just really get on social media. I mean, we're on Facebook and we're on Twitter and you can come to our website at theblackskyevent.com and get connected to those things and get involved and be involved and, and give us feedback on, I mean, we're putting articles out and stuff and, and talking to people and, and getting a community together so we can support some of these great uh, um organizations that are already out there like secure the grid and uh people who are trying to actually get something done um and trying to get our government to move forward to build a resilient or not the government it's the private sector because the government doesn't own the grid (laughs) the private sector does but you know we can make a difference and we can make the grid more resilient and that's what we're trying to do and just raise awareness so that people actually care i mean i start talking to a lot of people about this and what what we've tried to do is is make a very complex and you know issue in in so many uh levels understandable because it's it's just it's a hard thing to to take in and so we just want to raise awareness and uh, so yeah, anybody that can come in and support us. And then of course, once we have the film out buy the film, <laughs> get it out there, yeah, you know, share it with people. Distribute the film, get it out and about, Yeah, get on some uh, network with this film. Yeah. Um, well, we're looking at, you know, of course, all the streaming networks and, and uh, we got delayed because of COVID because uh, we had some interviews that we were trying to do that we couldn't do, uh, because the individuals we wanted to interview didn't, you know, weren't open to it at the time. And so we've almost, we've only got a couple more interviews to do now, but we've been editing all this time. We've taken advantage of it. So we hope to have it out by, um, year's end, you know, that's, that's what we're shooting for. If not okay, before, I get it out before uh, December. <laughs> yeah. Well, if it's December, you know, I don't think anybody wants to listen to this during Christmas. So we may wait till after the first of the year then. You know? well. Although it would make I, I, great I stocking thinking, stuffer, right? For the prepper who has everything or, you, you know. Hey. I was thinking space is it's a Vicky's dream, you know, but if that happens, we're, we're too late. <laughs> yeah. The sooner but, the better because people, government moves at such a slow pace and the power industry, I mean, it just takes them forever to do anything. And usually the things that they're doing or the things that they've currently regulated to be put in the power grid now to protect us aren't really going to protect us once they have them in. And, and, and that's just, they just won't make the commitment to protect us. Bingo. Well, we have an old adage. We, we get peace about called the speed of government. Yes. <laughs> it happens that 
this means snail. The government. Yeah, with the, you know, <laughs> lower than a snail typically. They have to do more studies of the study of the study of the study. Yeah. That's what yeah. happens. And let's have a meeting to talk about. Uh, right. We're going to set up a meeting to plan meetings. <laughs> right. We've all we've all got to keep our jobs, and we've got to support the the intellectual base of our universities to produce more studies and all these think tanks. Just produce more studies and study it and study it. Yeah. You know, that's the thing about the grid. I mean, especially the EMP threat. I mean, the military has already done all this. Now they didn't declassify at all, but they declassified enough of it. And the people on the EMP commission were the ones that were actually there and they saw the starfish prime test and they knew about this and, and they actually hardened a lot of the grid for the military and they still can't talk about some of that, but we should listen to them about how to fix it because they know they're the ones that know. So other things that to bear in mind is uh, go see my video that I did with uh, Ambassador Hank Cooper because he talks about how he got the Carolinas to harden their grid. And this is something a lot of you can do by working directly with your EMA people, uh, your emergency providers, talking to them, get to your National Guard if you can, especially when you get to your edge of the general. That may be hard for a lot of people to do, but you can start working with your local EMA people and eventually you can work it up to the state level. And I did that and I got to my, to my state EMP, uh, EMA director. So uh, these are all things that you as individuals can do. You can write letters to your congressman and say, hey, we got laws in the book. Let's make the companies do these things. But one of the other things that uh, we're aware of that could be done is if we could get money and, you know, they're always passing these ginormous trillion dollar infrastructure bills. If we get just a piece of that set aside uh, to, for hardening the grid, then that would make it easier for the companies to swallow because what happens is the companies can't raise the rates because the PSCs, public services, I mean, public services, I mean, don't want to get, give them the authority to do it because then they got to answer to the people that voted for them. And so you get kind of a spiral that's kind of hard to get it through. So uh, if they had some other revenue to make some of that happen, it might make it easier. I mean, we spend trillions and trillions of dollars on defense, but our most vulnerable thing, we spend nothing on. This is our Achilles heel. This is the most vulnerable thing going on in our country today if we hard, do anything we need to harden the grid if we don't do anything else we need to harden the grid very well said oh well, <laughs> well i hope i didn't talk too much david I no think. you were great thanks i appreciate you having me on thanks it was great to talk to you and see you i haven't seen you in a long time so yeah, it's been a i have to go head back over to huntsville and visit again so Neither great place you. beautiful Neither city have. And I'm sure we could find some other things to entertain some of your other documentaries and programs you're doing. <laughs> Absolutely. But Absolutely. That's what was an interesting place, if anything else, right? <laughs> yeah, it's very cool. It's a neat place. A lot of smart people in Huntsville, that's for sure. We have more PhDs per capita and more engineers per capita than any place. Yeah. You can't throw a rock it's amazing. without getting two or three of us. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Well, that's great. Well, I really appreciate you having me on, Greg. Thank you so much. All right, well, hang on for a second when I end the program. I just want to tell everyone, uh, subscribe to my channels, the Galactic Gregs and Green Gregs. Uh, we're going to have a lot more videos to come that will be very interesting on uh, power grid defense and many other things. So on Galactic Gregs' side, a lot more about what we can do in space. I'm going to do some videos on just some of the basics because there's tons of channels out there explaining rocket tech, rockets and what's going on with them. And here's the latest feature on, say, a starship, you know, uh, or the spaceship, you know, uh, in case it's uh, Virgin Galactic, which I happen to know that system pretty intimately. <laughs> Having developed hair, launched hybrid rockets, a lot of my guys work on that, by the way. And <laughs> at one time, I hired George Whiteside to be executive director of the National Space Society. So, yeah, I got a, uh, you know, I got a little inside scoop on that system. And, and of course, there's a lot of stuff out there. I'll be covering a lot of videos on these. Says, oh, I know a little bit about the space launch system, you know, Artemis. <laughs> uh, Space Station, the ISS, the robotic systems on the Space Station. Yeah, I know that stuff. The power systems in the ISS. Yeah, yep, yep. Been there, done that. Uh, but on Green Greg's side, you know, my proposition is to help you survive, thrive, and stay out of the hive. And right now, we're highly challenged in these regards, all the things coming at us. Uh, our society has is, is got threats coming at us from every direction. It's kind of like you're sitting on the railroad track, and but there's not one train coming at you, no, coming at you from every direction. And so you can't tell where, what's the end of the tunnel and what's the train. So we've got to really, I tell people on my channel, they got to keep the eyes wide open and head on the swivel more than ever right now. So that's what we're trying to do. And let's hope and pray that nothing happens until we can get this grid hardened, that we can get it done and this country survives and is prosperous and we can get through all this strife that we're dealing with right now. 
and find peaceful ways to build internationally. They've got a lot of challenges ahead of us. It don't mean it can't be done. And I'm, I haven't said that any of these things will absolutely happen, except the sun will do something if we don't get the spirit hard eventually. It could happen tomorrow morning, or it might be 20, 30, 40 years from now. But uh, we're overdue. <laughs> anyway. Definitely. Uh, let's hope that we stay over to you for a long time. <laughs> yeah, I'm good with that. I'm good with that too, David. But I appreciate what you're doing. You're a patriot because what you're doing is you're trying to get the word out there to wake people up. People can't take action until they realize they got a problem. So right. you got to wake people up first. And that is what you're doing. So I salute you, sir, uh, for your effort. <laughs> Thank I know you. There are things that you can be doing that's far more profitable than this. And some people bang on me because, you know, occasionally I talk, you know, I give a commercial or something. It's like, gee, if I want to make money on YouTube, I would do videos. Hey, I've got, right. cats. I've got cats. Go to the channel. Yeah. We'll see like, you know, 19 million views for a video called <laughs> rabbit waking up to the sound of a banana. Yeah. I mean, it's well, crazy. I mean, well, people I'm, don't, people don't realize how much time and money and effort goes into these things. And I mean, you know, you've got to make your revenue back somehow just to break even you know, because it's, it's, it's expensive It is and time consuming. It's very time consuming. It takes away from other things that are important. Absolutely. But the people need to know this stuff. It's got to get out there. It's got to get out there. And so again, I appreciate everything you've done. You're, you're awesome. Let well, thank me you, Greg. Uh, the recording here. So everybody on Galactic Gregs and Green Gregs, I really want to thank you for watching. So, so that I'll know that you've watched it this far. Say, Hey, Greg, it takes a lot of coffee to stay with you this long. <laughs> and I know you got this. I always tell them something like that. <laughs> that's great. <laughs> this is I like that. I have to remember that long. trick. And that's kind of a trick to keep people. They know I do that. So they'll, you know, they'll hang on maybe. Anyway, everyone again, I just got to say thank you.